Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, and Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Hi, I'm your host, John McKeel, and I'm the author of the little book, Peter, the Friend of Jesus Speaks. And in our study together, we'll look at the little epistle of 1 Peter. It's tucked away at the back of the New Testament, but that belies its importance. It's a vital book full of inspiration and encouragement for us as Christians. So who were the Christians Peter addressed in his first letter? How did Peter meet them? Did the apostle and his wife have a missionary journey across northern Turkey as Paul and his companions did through central Turkey? Uh, just reading the letter, it's obvious the disciples were suffering for their faith. Just a few years later, we read about Pliny the Younger's persecution of the Christians in Bithynia in a letter he wrote reporting to the emperor Trajan. I have asked them if they are Christians, and if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time with a warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. For whatever the nature of their admission, I am convinced that their stubbornness and their unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. They also declared that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this that they had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately among themselves in honor of Christ, as if to a god, and also to bind themselves by an oath, not for any criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. This made me decide it was all the more necessary to extract the truth by torture of two slave women whom they called deaconesses. I found nothing but a degenerate sort of cult carried to extravagant lengths. Theologians have argued endlessly about how we were chosen, but practically speaking, that doesn't matter. Calvinists talk about the five points of Tulip, and the followers of Jacob Arminius disagree. Peter wasn't concerned, and we shouldn't be either. We are called, we are chosen, we are God's elect. So what does that mean? First, this world is not my home. We are exiles. The word means stranger, sojourner, resident alien. Two out of the three places this word is used in the New Testament are in this letter. Chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 11, and then in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Cognates of this word are found on inscriptions in the Roman world to describe civil servants who distinguish themselves for exemplary conduct while on international duty. Similarly, the author of 1 Peter makes an intimate connection between the status of the addressees as virtual visitors in the world because of their special relation to God through Jesus Christ and their moral responsibility. Exiles are not immigrants. We are only here temporarily. That means our citizenship is in heaven. We long for our home. We find fellow exiles and celebrate the traditions and customs of our homeland. We must be aware of our surroundings and live exemplary lives while we are here. We must be ready to leave at any time. There is a great day coming, so don't put down roots. Notice how Peter mentions the Trinity. It's the Father's plan. The Spirit sanctifies us, and we obey the Son who is the High Priest, sprinkling us with his blood. Let's talk about the Father's plan. Peter begins, quote, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In the New Testament, the Greek equivalent of foreknowledge appears seven times. It refers to the Christian's advance warning about false teachers. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, the Jews' previous knowledge of Paul's early life. 
Acts chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Uh, God's previous knowledge of the death of Christ, Acts chapter 2, verse 23, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. We'll look at that a little bit later. And his knowledge of his people, Romans chapter 11, verse 2, and of the church, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, our text here. You know, Harwood's A Liberal Translation of the New Testament, written in 1768, translate the word foreknowledge as, quote, the original design of God, which ties nicely with verses 18 through 20. And this is no afterthought, even though it was only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge. God always knew he was going to do this for you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, the message. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Peter, phrases, uh, Peter praises the sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification differs from justification because sanctification is a process and justification is a result. Sanctification is often translated holiness. Have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit is called holy. We rarely talk about our Holy Father or the Holy Son, but the Spirit is often called holy. That may be to distinguish the Holy Spirit from evil spirits, but I believe it is more than that. It is the special work of the Spirit to make us holy. Holy is his job description. We were justified when we became Christians. Our sins were forgiven. We will be no more justified on the day we meet Jesus than we were when we obeyed the gospel. On the other hand, sanctification is a process. We grow in Christ and the Holy Spirit is the one empowering us, changing us. And now let's talk about Jesus, our high priest. Finally, uh, the purpose of the Spirit's work is to equip us for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Sprinkling with blood is a priestly function. Aaron's garments were sprinkled with blood to consecrate them. Exodus twenty nine twenty one. Blood was often sprinkled by the priest to cleanse many different places in Leviticus. And notice in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cried for vengeance. Christ's blood cries for salvation. Thanks for joining us this morning. I hope you'll be with us next time as we continue looking at Peter, the friend of Jesus, speaks. <music>